everyone, Lainey here. I wanted to make you aware of something you might already have seen if you follow us on our social media channels, or if you happen to look at your playlist and go, what show is this? Well, I recently changed the name of the podcast. We are no longer known as True Crime Fan Club. We are now known as True Crime Cases with Lainey. When I started the True Crime Fan Club podcast in 2016, I had no clue about ethics or the people behind these cases and how it affected them truly. As time passed and I learned more, I decided to make a change. So you may not know this, but I cringed any time I had to share the name of the show with other podcasters or with survivors of crimes. And I decided that I needed to take a step in a different direction. So after the True Crime Podcast Festival in 2022, I felt even more blah about the show and the name of the show. Now, True Crime Fan Club, or TCFC, still live on in the background as our media company, so the name is not up for grabs for anyone out there wondering. There's nothing you need to do on your end, just continue listening and sharing the show. I'm not joking when I say that it really does help. I have a lot more to do on the back end, so changes are still slowly occurring, and I just want to thank those who heard me out and encouraged me to make the change, and I hope that you'll stick around for the long haul. Okay, enough of the business. Back to the show. Explicit content is found in this episode, so listener discretion is advised. The True Crime and Paranormal Podcast Festival will be held on August 25th through the 27th, 2023 in Austin, Texas. Join other ethical true crime podcasters, victim advocates, and paranormal creators for a weekend full of panels, roundtables, and live shows. Purchase your early bird tickets now at truecrimepodcastfestival.com slash tickets. If you're in the DFW area on September 22nd, 2022 and September 23rd, 2022, I'll be joined by my dear friends Eric from True Consequences and Whitney and Melissa from Colts, Crimes, and Cabernet for True Crime Live. Click on the link in our show notes to buy your tickets. Explicit content is found in this episode, so listener discretion is advised. Welcome back to the True Crime Fan Club Podcast. I'm your host, Lainey. According to the National Missing and Unidentified Person System, or NamUs, 600,000 people go missing every year. Thankfully, many of these children, women, and men return home shortly afterwards, but tens of thousands of individuals stay missing for over a year, with few, if any, leads to go on. Approximately 4,500 unidentified remains are found each year as well. Yet despite the serious nature of these cases of missing and unidentified persons, there are still people who will fake kidnappings and perpetrate hoaxes for their own gains on a regular basis often at the expense of others. Okay, on to the show. Stacy Smart, a 51-year-old mother who lived in Lewiston, California, last had contact with her family on October 12, 2016. What we do know is that she attended a housewarming party on October 15th, last used her debit card on October 16th, and volunteered at the Moose Lodge on October 17th and 18th of 2016. Stacy was not reported missing until November 2nd. At the time of Stacy's disappearance, she was living with her boyfriend, Tony Brand, near Lewiston Lake. Shortly after she was reported missing, Stacy's boyfriend changed his carpet and told her family Stacy had moved out. In late October, Stacy's grandmother sadly passed away, but still no one heard from Stacy. Her mother tried to call Stacy's phone, but it had been disconnected. Stacy's daughter Nicole also found it odd that Stacy did not reach out on Halloween, which was always one of their favorite holidays. On December 29th, 2016, Stacy's family released 100 light blue balloons to celebrate her 52nd birthday in her absence and try to keep her case in the minds of the public. Several searches were done by members of the community, and Lewiston Lake was searched by divers, but they did not find anything substantial. The family also spoke to a hostage negotiator early on, and also sought a grant from the McConnell Foundation to fund a reward. 
To this day, there have been no significant leads in the disappearance of Stacy Smart. There is currently a $10,000 reward for viable information regarding Stacy Smart's disappearance. Although there were numerous supposed sightings of Stacy early on, none of these ended up being valid. Her family is doing their best to ensure the search continues for Stacy and continues to host and participate in events that will keep Stacy in the public eye. At the time of her disappearance, Stacy had platinum blonde hair cut in a pixie cut. She stands 5'8 and weighs 160 pounds. She has blue eyes and a tattoo of a large red lotus blossom on her lower back. She also had rods and pins put in her leg and foot. If you have any information on the disappearance or whereabouts of Stacy Smart, please contact the Trinity County Sheriff's Office at 530-623-3740 or the NorCal Alliance for the Missing, anonymous tip line at 530-378-4491. Roughly 40 miles away in Redding, California, November 2, 2016, started out as usual. Families went to school and work, including the Papini family. By that evening, Redding would be mentioned on all the major news outlets, and pictures of Sherry Papini would be splashed across the front pages and magazine covers for weeks. Conversely, Stacy Smart's disappearance has barely warranted a handful of newspaper articles in the years since she's been missing. Sherry's husband, Keith, received a text from his wife on the morning of November 2, 2016, urging him to come home for lunch so they could have sex. Keith, who was a home theater technician for Best Buy, had too many appointments that day so he could not slip away. That was the last text that he received from her that day, although he was so busy he didn't really think much about it. However, when he arrived home, the house was dark and Sherry was not home with the kids. Keith tried to call Sherry, but she did not answer or return his calls, so he checked the Find My iPhone app and tracked her phone just a short distance away from their driveway. When he looked down, he saw Sherry's phone on the ground. There was hair caught in her headphones, and their wedding song, Everything, by Michael Buble, was playing on repeat. He called 911 and said he had just arrived home and she was gone, so he thought she was out for a walk. He said he couldn't find her and called the daycare to see when she had picked up the kids, and found out that the kids had not been picked up yet. This caused Keith to panic, and he told the 911 operator, I'm totally freaking out, thinking that somebody grabbed her. Sherry was a stay-at-home mom who was called Supermom by many of her friends. Just a few days before her disappearance, the family had spent Halloween with extended family, and she said she was going to make sweet potatoes for her kids on Thanksgiving. Family and friends alike agreed that Sherry would not have simply walked away from her children. It's no secret that when someone disappears, investigators immediately look to the person's spouse, significant other, or other family members. Within days, Keith Papini had agreed to a polygraph test to rule him out as a suspect. Although polygraph tests are not concrete proof of innocence, Keith's was enough to have him ruled out and law enforcement continued to search the foothills in the area. The community rallied around Keith and the children, with volunteers walking grid patterns to search for Sherry. A local company provided hundreds of flyers with Sherry's picture and details. The flyer soon hung all over Shasta County. The family contacted multiple media outlets, who eagerly rushed to broadcast the news that a petite, blonde-haired, blue-eyed mom of two had vanished into thin air. Almost two weeks after Sherry disappeared, Keith and Sherry's sister Sheila went to the Reading City Council and requested permission to release balloons in Sherry's honor to bring more focus on her disappearance. The mayor of Reading at the time, Missy MacArthur, said, We will make that happen, and our prayers are with you. A GoFundMe account was set up, and money for ransom and rewards totaling 100000 were offered by a number of individuals. Investigators were looking everywhere for any information about Sherry's disappearance. Their first suspect was Donovan Miskey from Michigan. Donovan and Sherry had met there in 2011 at a conference. The two struck up a relationship, even though Sherry had married Keith two years prior. Donovan had no idea she was married, but the relationship eventually fizzled out anyway, since it was difficult to maintain. Donovan said of Sherry, she was pretty magical. The pair hadn't spoken in quite some time, 
until she unexpectedly messaged him on October 29, 2016, four days before she went missing. Donovan was at a conference in San Francisco when she messaged, so he assumed she had seen this on his Facebook page. She suggested they meet, but when she said she was four to five hours away, Donovan said, Yikes. She sent him one cryptic message that if they did not meet now, they would never meet again. Donovan decided he was going to stay away from her, because the messages were becoming stranger and stranger. Despite his reticence, when investigators found their messages, it prompted a visit from multiple members of law enforcement in Donovan's office in Michigan. Donovan later revealed that he was racking his brain trying to figure out why Shasta County detectives, Michigan police officers, and U.S. Marshals had shown up. Donovan showed them his cell phone data and pictures he had taken in San Francisco, which proved he did not make contact with Sherry. Officers searched his apartment while he was at work, claiming the door was open. Despite Donovan's frustration about this dubiously legal search, he was relieved that it cleared him. Investigators were at a loss. Then, a major break came in the case. On November 24, 2016, Thanksgiving Day, a mom and her daughter were driving north on I-5, heading to a family member's house for the holiday. Around 4.30 in the morning, Allison Sutton was shocked to see a petite woman standing as close to traffic as possible, trying to flag someone down. The woman was waving a piece of fabric or something and looked wild-eyed and scared. Allison could not stop safely to assist the woman, but pulled over as soon as she could and called 911 to report what she had seen. A truck driver also stopped and stayed with the woman until California Highway Patrol arrived. When the first officer arrived on the scene, he quickly asked for Yolo County deputies to respond Code 3, which means respond quickly with lights and sirens. The officer revealed he was with Sherry Papini, and it was a confirmed kidnapping. Sherry looked battered, worn down, and emaciated. Before she had vanished, she barely weighed 100 pounds. But in the 22 days since she was last seen, she had lost at least 10 pounds. Her long blonde hair had been hacked off, her face was bruised, and she had rashes on her thighs and ligature marks around her wrists and ankles. She had been burned on her left forearm and had been branded on her right shoulder, although investigators could not make out what the brand was. Sherry told investigators that she thought it was a passage from the book of Exodus in the Bible. It's a really confusing Bible passage. It doesn't really make any sense. Sherry refused to talk to investigators in the beginning, so they gave Keith an audio recorder and asked him to record their conversations. Sherry revealed to her husband that two women had abducted her while she was out on her jog. The women were wearing masks, but wrapped her head with something so she couldn't see them. Sherry said she might have been drugged or hit by a stun gun as she was put in the dark SUV, but she couldn't remember a lot and kept falling asleep. She said the car smelled bad and her abductors played mariachi music nonstop, and she described them as Latina women, one with thick bushy eyebrows and one with thin eyebrows. Sherry said she was kept chained in a small room for the next 22 days, forced to wear an adult diaper use the bathroom in a bucket, or use kitty litter. Sherry claimed the woman would beat her if she looked at them, although presumably they were masked the entire time. She asked them why they did this, and they finally answered, We sell you, and your buyer is a cop. Sherry said she'd try to get out once by slamming the older woman's head into the toilet. They caught her, and that's when they branded her. The woman read her articles about her disappearance and laughed, saying that no one believed that she was really missing. Sherry's release came after she heard a gunshot one evening. The next day, the younger woman was alone when she forced Sherry into the car, then dropped her off on I-5. A press conference was held a few days after Sherry resurfaced, and details of her abductors were released to the public. Investigators told the police that the two women were considered armed and dangerous. 
tips began flooding into the Shasta County Sheriff's Department, mostly involving suspicious-looking Latina women. On November 29th, Keith Papini read a written statement to ABC, mostly in response to the pervasive doubt that Sherry had actually been kidnapped. He first thanked all the many individuals and organizations who had rallied around the family during Sherry's disappearance. He then said, We live in a nation of free speech, accompanied with an era of technology that provides immediate gratification. This is a double-edged sword. I am grateful for this system as it is what spread my wife's face so quickly throughout the world, gaining the attention of thousands. The unfortunate side is that some people have been sitting in angering, expectant positions, waiting for the gory details. Rumors, assumptions, lies, and hate have been both exhausting and disgusting. Keith continues on in strong support of his wife, Sherry, and describes how horrified he was when he first saw her in the hospital bed after her return. Law enforcement was quick to tell the public they had no reason to doubt Sherry's account and that they were still searching for her abductors. Detectives requested a search warrant to investigate cell phone records of cell tower pings close to where Sherry disappeared and where she was dropped off. They were looking for phones that hit both cell towers on those two days. Luckily, they found six numbers. The broad warrant allowed them to look at all data associated with the cell phone numbers to include photos, text messages, and the billing information. One of the numbers returned to a dark-haired young woman who was interviewed by detectives a few days after Sherry's returned, but turned out to not be involved in the incident. As investigators began digging into Sherry's life, they discovered multiple inconsistencies in her account of what had happened to her. She first said that she had zip ties around her wrists, which were behind her back, but she would later say that her hands were in front of her and she chewed through the restraints. Then she said that one of her abductors had used a taser on her, but never mentioned that part again. She first said she was branded because she tried to escape, but then she said she was branded because the man who was buying her wanted her marked. While she was missing, the FBI had obtained search warrants for Sherry's phone records and social media accounts. They discovered she had been secretly messaging not only Donovan Miskey, but another unidentified man. Their phone numbers were entered into her phone under women's names. Sherry's first husband and at least one ex-boyfriend told investigators that she was a pathological liar. One even said, she doesn't have the ability to be truthful. Nearly a decade after her disappearance, DNA results were returned to investigators. There was male DNA found on Sherry's clothing, and it was not Keith's. Adding to the mystery, the DNA was found on Sherry's underwear. Investigators said this didn't necessarily mean she'd had sex with another man, but it really made investigators question the veracity of her tale. Years later, in March 2020, the DNA found in her underwear matched with DNA on a family tree database. The DNA was traced back to the mother of Sherry's ex-boyfriend, James Reyes. On June 9, 2020, investigators collected items from James's trash, including an empty tea bottle. When they tested the DNA, it matched the DNA found on Sherry's underwear. James had known Sherry for several years, and they had even been engaged at one point. The year before Sherry's disappearance, James had found some of her photographs while cleaning, so he sent them to her parents. She called him not long after, claiming to have missed him and that she wanted to run away with him and had been saving money to do so. Sherry told James that Keith abused her, including beating her and raping her. She claimed she needed to get out. They bought prepaid phones so Keith wouldn't see his number and question who it was. Sherry sent James a note telling him where to meet her on the day of her kidnapping. He had a friend rent a car for him and he drove to the Reading Starbucks, then waited to hear from her. When she sent him a text, he pulled up to the spot and she jumped in the back seat. She lay down and slept most of the way back to his hometown of Costa Mesa. Once they got there, James bought her some sweats and t-shirts to wear. He didn't believe Sherry ever left the house while he was at work and aside from eating together, said she did not leave her room. She asked him to board up the window of the room where she slept, 
which looked incidentally like the room she described to the FBI. After a few weeks, she wanted to see her kids again, but she had to prepare, so she began hitting and burning herself. She chopped off her hair and asked for his assistance with other injuries. Sherry asked him to hit her legs with a hockey puck, so he complied. She then had him hold up his hockey stick so she could run into it with her nose. When she asked him to go to Hobby Lobby and buy a wood-burning tool, he agreed. Then, he shakily tried to brand her with the message Papini wanted. He told investigators she never complained about the pain. Right before Thanksgiving, she said it was time for her to go home, so she had his friend rent him another car and drove her to an orchard right on the front of Trode, then went to his aunt's house for dinner that night. There were no women involved in her kidnapping, in particular, Latinas. James didn't know any. Three of his relatives knew Sherry was at his apartment, but none of them ever spoke to investigators until after James was questioned. Sherry was confronted by the FBI, but continued to say she was abducted. The only thing she admitted to was talking to other men, but she didn't admit this until after Keith had left the room. She was free to go, but investigators began building their case against her. In March 2022, officers approached Sherry while she was waiting on her children to finish their piano lessons. She screamed and tried to run from them, but she was handcuffed and placed in a patrol car. During an initial hearing, Sherry's attorney requested bond, saying she was not a flight risk. The judge recessed the hearing and called for another hearing after that weekend. At this one, he allowed her to be released on a $120,000 bond, but she had to relinquish her passport, not drink or take drugs, and undergo psychiatric treatment. Although she had many family members at the hearing to support her, her husband Keith was not among them. Neither he nor James Reyes were charged with any crimes. Sherry was charged with mail fraud and lying to a federal officer. The mail fraud stemmed from money she claimed from the California Victims' Compensation Board. She received $30,000 from them, which was used to pay for her ambulance transportation, counseling, and to remodel her house. She also used some of these funds to pay off a credit card. The GoFundMe account had raised $49,000 which the Papinis used to pay off bills. On April 12, 2022, Sherry Papini signed a plea agreement. On April 18, 2022, Sherry pleaded guilty to mail fraud and making false statements to federal officials. If found guilty, she could serve up to five years for making false statements and 20 years for mail fraud. In addition to possible prison time, Sherry will also be required to make restitution to the California Victims' Compensation Board the Social Security Administration, and law enforcement agencies, who spent at least $150,000 on the search for Sherry. In total, she is facing nearly $300,000 in restitution fees. On April 22, 2012, Keith Papini filed for divorce from Sherry. In court documents, Keith said that the family had received hate mail and death threats after Sherry's disappearance. Both I, and especially our children, were traumatized by her disappearance, and I spent much time and money trying to find my wife. The trauma inflicted on our children at the unexpected loss of their mother was heartbreaking. Sherry issued a public apology, stating she was deeply ashamed of myself for my behavior and so sorry for the pain I've caused my family, my friends, all the good people who needlessly suffered because of my story and those who worked so hard to try to help me. I will work the rest of my life to make amends for what I've done. Unfortunately, Sherry Papini's actions traumatized more than her family and close friends. Countless individuals believed her story and searched for her, also donating money to the GoFundMe. Worse than that is the fact that her story targeted a marginalized community. Tips poured in constantly for months about Latina women who looked suspicious and hostile. Stacy Smart's family also suffered greatly in the wake of Sherry Papini's hoax. Stacy's daughter Nicole said that there were hundreds of people searching for Sherry every day. The Trinity County Sheriff's Office did not have a search and rescue team at the time, and when my family and I reached out to the organization for help, everyone was too busy searching for Sherry. 
we could have used some of those volunteers and more boots on the ground. To learn more about Stay Sea Smart and download the missing persons flyer, please click the link in our show notes. Okay, fan club members, as I conclude this episode, my one question to you is, how will you sleep tonight? Thank you for listening. If you enjoy our podcast, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts or your podcast player of choice. It really does help. You can also follow us on our social media. We're active on Twitter at TrueCrimeFCPod, Facebook at Facebook.com slash TCFCPodcast, Instagram at TrueCrimeFanClubPod, and our website is TrueCrimeFanClub.com. We'd love to hear your episode suggestions, so feel free to send us an email at TCFCPod at gmail.com. This episode was researched and written by Susie St. John, with content editing by Jesse Hawk. Produced by the best in the business, Neeks at We Talk of Dreams. Check him out on Twitter at We Talk of Dreams or WeTalkOfDreams.com.